I'm going to go, I don't know what Mark told you last week, but I'm going to go back to extreme basics for genetics and work my way forward. So to start out with, what I define as genetics is very, very simple. It all comes down to simply relating differences in DNA sequence between individuals to differences in expressed characteristics. So comparing genotype and phenotype, you're doing genetics. Everything else, gene expression, et cetera, you can throw away from my point of view. That's genomics. I don't care about genomics. Genetics, sequence difference, phenotype. So the reason that it's powerful has to do with how the DNA is packaged and how it's passed on, and that is that not every gene is passed on individually, and it's packaged essentially into these long strings that are coated with protein, but essentially within a given string or chromosome, there's a contiguous stretch of DNA that is passed on separate from the other strings of DNA and the other chromosomes, but in fact is not necessarily passed on as an intact string. It's actually passed on as a mosaic, and I will explain that after I get to the fact that we're talking at the beginning of Mendelian genetics, and Mendelian genetics simply means that you can follow the pattern of inheritance of the phenotype within a family, and therefore predict the inheritance of the gene that causes that phenotype within the family. And there are various modes of inheritance, with autosomal dominance simply being a case where, even though you have two chromosomes of the same type, one that came from your mother, one that came from your father, it only takes one copy of the defective gene to cause the phenotype. And so, given that, you have two copies, you have the phenotype, because you have the defective gene, each of your children is going to have a 50-50 chance of inheriting it. And so if you see a 50-50 pattern of inheritance, you say, aha, autosomal dominant. If the dominant is on the X chromosome, because males only have one X, you don't get always a 50-50 pattern. It depends on whether it's being passed through a male or a female. So you get X-linked dominant inheritance. If the problem in the gene is not one that is sufficient by itself, to cause phenotype because you have another copy of the gene on the other chromosome that's intact and that's sufficient to prevent the phenotype, then you don't see the inheritance unless that other copy is also defective, in which case you see recessive inheritance because both of them have to get together. And if you have two carrier parents, one child in four is going to give the phenotype on average. So Mendelian genetics just means you can follow the inheritance pattern and predict something about the gene. Complex inheritance means you're more likely to show the phenotype because a relative has showed the phenotype, but you can't predict the, the exact pattern of inheritance. And the one very special case is the mitochondrial genome, which is passed down only from mothers, uh, and therefore shows maternal inheritance. And every child of that mother gets that mitochondrial genome, and so has the phenotype if, I hope the next slide is the right slide, the phenotype is fully penetrant. So penetrance is an important uh, concept, which is the likelihood that a person who carries the genetic defect is going to display the phenotype. Penetrance doesn't have to be 100% for you to follow the pattern in the families, but it has to be reasonably high for you to follow the pattern because everybody who doesn't show the phenotype but should have the defect is an exception. And you're only willing to accept a certain number of exceptions in your pattern recognition before you lose the pattern. Okay? But a penetrance of 90% means you carry the defect. 10% of the people who carry it aren't going to show symptoms. It's non-penetrant. Okay. Very important concept because essentially the difference between complex disease and Mendelian disease is penetrance. So there are two ways that have been looked at in these diseases called Mendelian, but another way of thinking about them because the penetrance is high is to simply say, they are strong effect mutations. They're, effect, they're mutations that have a strong likelihood of causing a problem. So there are two ways that people have gone about looking for it. In the early days, people thought that they could use a biased approach of choosing candidates based on what they knew about the biology of the system they were studying uh, and attempt to get to the gene by saying, I, I'm smart, I know which one of the 20,000 or so genes is going to be defective because I can tell because of what's going wrong with the heart or with the lung or with the brain, et cetera, I, I can tell what it is. And most of the time when people did that, they were completely wrong. But it was, it was a very pursued approach. It was, it was popular. 
The other approach that became possible with DNA polymorphism was the ability to scan all chromosomal regions in an unbiased way for evidence of the presence of a defect that causes the phenotype without knowing anything about it. So the early days allowed for doing that by linkage analysis. And so the definition of linkage analysis essentially is correlating the inheritance of genotype with phenotype. So remember genetics, DNA sequence differences in the DNA related to phenotype. In this case, linkage simply means you're doing that relationship in the context of a family where you're tracking the inheritance of the genotype and saying, does the inheritance of the genotype correlate with the inheritance of the phenotype or with the expression of the phenotype within the family? And the reason that it works goes back to the packaging of the DNA and the fact that the chromosome is a single string of DNA but is not, in fact, passed on intact but is also not passed on randomly in shattered pieces. The chromosomes are passed on from generation to generation as linear mosaics. So if you were able to color the chromosomes in the grandparent's generation, and let's focus on the maternal grandfather and color one of his chromosome fours red and one of them black, and forget all the other chromosomes, you've colored these ones, and you're able to track them. If you went from the grandparental generation to the parental generation to the mother, so the maternal grandfather down to the mother, you'll see that she didn't inherit either red or black. She inherited a linear mosaic of those based on crossovers of the DNA and exchange events. So the DNA crosses over, breaks, and rejoins, but in a linear fashion. It's not shuffled. It simply goes in a linear fashion. So if that occurs in every generation, by the time you get down to that next generation, you can see that you've got a linear mosaic now of the red and the black and the blue and what was supposed to be orange, and you get this very mixed-up-looking chromosome. But that arrow points to a defective gene in the red. So where that region is red down below, you're going to see the arrow. That kid's going to have the disease because it's a dominant defect. Wherever at that location there's no red, there's no arrow, there's no disease. That's linkage analysis. And it works because exchange events occur frequently enough that they create this mosaic, but not so frequently that they separate genes constantly. On average, 1% recombination corresponds to about a million bases of DNA. So within a chromosome of 200 million bases, if you track a particular bit of DNA and say, I can track the inheritance of this DNA, not by color now, but because there's a sequence difference. And there's many ways of detecting that sequence difference. I won't get into that immediately. But let's say you can track that sequence difference. If you do track that sequence difference and there is a defective gene somewhere near it, say within a million bases, then they are going to track together 99% of the time because the recombination is only 1% frequency for a million bases. Conversely, if they're within 10 million bases, so 1 20th of the chromosome, they're still going to track together 90% of the time. So finding things by linkage, if you have sufficient number of inheritance events, is actually fairly straightforward for a high penetrance phenotype. Recessive is a little bit more complicated, but it's the same concept, which is that you need a defect twice. You need a defect in one chromosome on the paternal side and one on the maternal side that gets passed down. The parents are carriers. They don't show any symptoms because one copy of the defective gene is not sufficient to cause them. But then in the child's generation, if you get both copies and notice they're different colors because they're not the same defects, they're just the same gene that's defective, you get the symptoms and you get two carriers on average and you'll get one who's free. So simple linkage just defines the rules of what you're looking for, whether you're looking for a single gene being inherited in a dominant fashion or the coincidence of two defectives. So again, when you go after this, in theory you could go and directly genotype causative mutations, and once you have a gene and you know what the defect is, you can go ahead and do that. A lot of research is done in relating genotype to phenotype by typing a known mutation after the gene's been found. But before the gene's been found, you don't have any way of doing that 
So you have to do indirect analysis of genotype. And what I described to you is saying, track a region of chromosome, and if anything within 10 million bases on either side is causing the defect, you're going to see the pattern of inheritance. That's indirect. The genotypic difference that you're looking at doesn't cause the phenotype. It's just in the neighborhood. So linkage and indirect analysis of genotype is simply looking at the neighborhood. There is a more modern technique simply because of the power that looking at DNA sequence differences allows over the last probably two decades, if you go push it out, and that is to look at association rather than linkage. Now what association means is you're correlating the presence of genotype with phenotype rather than the inheritance. So you're looking in individuals and saying, if I look at this genotype, and remember, genotype for me is simply DNA sequence difference, however detected. If I look at this genotype, is it present more frequently than you'd expect in people who have the phenotype, whether they're related or not? Okay? So association is fundamentally different, except why do they have it more frequently? Well, typically they have it more frequently because the particular genetic variation that they have has been passed on through many, 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 many generations back in human history to those same two people. So in fact, they are related. They're in a family. You just can't track the inheritance from generation to generation. So association in many circumstances is simply historical linkage. It's linkage within the human population rather than linkage within a discrete family where you have the members. Okay? So while they're fundamentally different in how you do them, conceptually it's the same idea. You had a change on a chromosome and you're tracking that chromosome, in one case through a family, in the other case through human populations and human history. Okay, so what do you get when you get there? I said that candidate approaches hadn't been terribly successful, and the reason was, by and large, we certainly two decades ago didn't know as much biology as we thought we did, and I would argue we still don't know as much biology as we think we do. But this shows a list of genes that people at Mass General who were associated originally with the Molecular Nerve Genetics Unit and then now with the CHGR were part of finding or mapping to chromosomes. This is a small subset, but it illustrates the point, which is that of the diseases that were attacked by linkage, where you got to the point of having the genetic defect, there was only one of these that was done by a candidate approach, and that was the one on the top of the list, which is hyperkalemic periodic paralysis. This is a very interesting disorder where you have a person who seems normal, they'll go out jogging for three or four miles, great, come back in the kitchen, eat a banana for breakfast, sit there, and 15 minutes later they can't get up. They're paralyzed. And the reason is because of the muscle sodium channel, which depolarizes but can't repolarize with high extracellular potassium. Okay? So there's a mutation in the channel. It turns out the same channel can cause different phenotypes. It can cause cold-sensitive paralysis. It can be associated with other aspects of muscle dysfunction. But because it was a muscle channel and it was a big part of how muscles work and you were paralyzed, it seemed like a good candidate, and you could have named other candidates too, but it happened that this candidate worked out. Everything else, Huntington's disease, Batten's disease, neurofibromatosis 1, 2, dystonia, dysautonomia, gave genes that would not have been predicted, either that didn't have a known function or that wouldn't have been predicted, even though you knew their function, based on the phenotype that you got. They would not have been high on the candidate list. So it showed that an unbiased approach allowed you to jump into the unknown and discover new biology rather than relying entirely on what you knew before. And so it really approached the science not as a strict hypothesis test, where you have a hypothesis and go test it, but as a data-gathering exercise where the pattern tells you what the answer is, enough that then you can set hypotheses. Because once you have these genes, now you can make hypotheses as to how they work. But getting them in the first place, putting you at the beginning of the disease rather than at the end of the disease, was important. So the fundamental principle in applying genetics, 
is that as a first step, it provides you with an unbiased tool for discovering factors that trigger or modify disease without any prior knowledge or bias concerning the nature of the mechanism. And so you can find out things that you wouldn't have found out by taking the traditional biased approach of taking phenotype and trying to explain how it got that way. Okay, this whole thing leads to a way of thinking about genetic research, human genetic research, particularly disease-related research, although you could apply the same concept uh, outside. But for disease research, people who do it tend to be in a certain mode. They're either trying to discover genes that cause a defect, they're trying to understand how the gene causes the phenotype once they know what it is, they're trying to do better diagnosis of disease, they're trying to do better treatment of disease, but, but the fundamental concept really in human genetics is it, it's all a continuum, it's all a cycle. And if you're a person who discovers a gene and your goal is to go on and now discover another gene, well, the first one that you discovered can be passed on to somebody whose expertise is to do mechanism and go around the cycle and benefit the people who have the disease. Similarly, if you're the kind of person who wants to go from start to finish, you can go around the cycle yourself, moving from discovering a gene to trying to understand the mechanism to try and treat it. But anybody who does human genetic research is actually working somewhere around this cycle. Whether they're going to keep moving or whether the disease is going to keep moving doesn't really matter. The point is knowledge moves around that cycle in an interactive way. It doesn't necessarily all move in one direction all the time because there are, there are things that connect across the cycle, but it is a continuum. And so I'm going to give you an example of that continuum that illustrates a number of points. It's the disorder that I've worked on the longest, which is Huntington's disease. I actually um, did my PhD at MIT and was fortunately presented with the choice after my PhD of either going to, uh, at the time, smog-laden Pasadena to work in the basement at Caltech with Lee Hood on one thing and one thing only, because Lee made it clear you were not allowed to think about anything other than your own project, or skip a postdoc and set up a lab at Mass General to apply molecular biology to Huntington's disease, which was this fascinating, mysterious thing. And so, of course, I chose the second one. So Huntington's disease is a movement disorder uh, that I'm going to describe in terms of the clinical view. So the clinician sees Huntington's disease as a relatively rare neurological disorder, one in 10,000 people. It's not super rare. It's not real common. Many, probably most neurologists will not have seen a Huntington's disease patient in their lifetime. Uh, but there are uh, uh, centers that, that um, focus on it because of, of it's frequent enough that there's enough patients and it's a very interesting disorder. It begins typically in midlife. So for 30, 40, 50 years, you could go see the neurologist once a week, they wouldn't know there was anything wrong with you. And then in midlife, you start this progressive, writhing movement disorder that might start as just very small movements that aren't even noticeable of, of accidentally knocking something off the, the uh, podium or bumping into the side when you try to walk by. And you wouldn't even notice it unless, of course, you knew your parent had this disease and then you view that potentially as the first sign. But those movements gradually uh, progress and they become this kind of writhing, constant motion. You just, it never stops, except when you're asleep. But as long as you're awake, you're doing this all the time. And then it gets worse and you, you can't do things that are, that you can't stop yourself from doing things that are damaging, like grinding your teeth together to the point where there's no teeth left, or, or driving your fingernails into your palms until it breaks the skin and moves in, or bones, rubbing against the skin to the point where it breaks through. So you have to be ultimately protected. You lose massive amounts of weight. 300 pound, pound football player might be 90 pounds by the time he dies. 15 years after onset, because long course, 15 years of gradual decline. There is intellectual decline, but it's not as bad as, as uh, other neurologic diseases. It's more the movement disorder that prevents communication. Now with computer keyboards, they can actually um, communicate very well, laid into the disease, psychiatric symptoms, uh, and, and there's no treatment to slow this. There's no treatment to prevent, okay? It's just a horrible disease. You're locked in this body, you, you're intellectually mostly intact, uh, and yet you can't control that body. Okay, so that's the clinician's view. Clinician 
diagnoses it typically based on the characteristic movement disorder, because a lot of the other symptoms occur in other disorders and are not specific. But this chorea, this characteristic chorea is really diagnostic of HD. Now you can do it with a DNA test because the linkage has been found and the gene has been found and the defect is known. But clinically, most clinicians will still diagnose the presence of the disease as opposed to the predisposition to the disease, the presence of the disease by the chorea. Okay, if you look at it from the neuropathology point of view, you have this region in the brain called the striatum that's made up of the putamen on one side and the caudate nucleus on the other side. And 80% of the neurons are medium spiny neurons. They die. So you lose the architecture of that region. You go from a region in which if you had an intact brain, you'd realize there's a space called the ventricle and the caudate is bulging into the ventricle going like this. And as the neurons die, it shrinks down until now it's going like this because there's no tissue left. There's just this thin ribbon around the edge. So you lose that region. You can see the medium spiny neurons. They die. If you looked at the whole brain, you'd see that region going from a space bulging into the ventricle to now an empty space. So the ventricle gets very big. But it's not the only effect. That's just the effect the neuropathologist sees first. If you move on into the disease, the overall brain loses 25% of its brain weight. There's cell loss in many other areas. But this area is most noticeable. The architecture is most disrupted. And it's the easiest one to relate to the movement disorder because this region controls the movements. Okay? So that's now the neuropathologist point of view. Notice I only mentioned the brain and I said the rest of the brain dies. There's actually stuff that goes on outside the brain too, but neuropathologists don't look there. So we don't have a good set of detail on what goes on outside the brain. And this is another example, if I go back to the start, of the traditional way of looking at disease is through phenotype. And phenotype is traditionally looked at by specialists. And so you don't get the whole picture in, I would argue, in almost any disease that you're going to hear work on. You're not hearing the whole picture. You're hearing the picture from the specialist who works on the system that is most notably disrupted in the disease. Okay, the geneticist point of view, just to get to the really specific. The geneticist looks at the disease and says, I don't really care about all that stuff. Can you tell me whether the disease is there or not, based on a phenotype? You know, I depend on my neurologist or my neuropathologist to give me a diagnosis, disease is there. Then I can track the inheritance pattern. If I can track the inheritance pattern, I can then find what's causing that inheritance pattern, what the defect is, by simply doing linkage. And in this case, we had a, a marker back in the early 80s that uh, detected sequence differences not by sequencing DNA, which you would do now, or by doing a PCR reaction of a particular spot. This was done by Southern Blot, where you had a DNA probe that was single copy, and you hybridized it to a blot in which the um, DNA fragments were splayed out by size, by electrophoresis, and you created those DNA fragments by cutting with restriction enzymes. And restriction enzymes, because they have recognition sites, fail to cut if there's a sequence change in one of the restriction sites. So what you're detecting back then was restriction fragment length polymorphisms or differences in fragment size. And it happened that we had a probe that saw two different restriction site polymorphisms, and so you had four fragments, so we called them A, B, C, and D. And in this case, C was traveling with the phenotype. And you'll notice that in the lowest generation, you have a number of people who have C who are darkened in because they have the phenotype, but you have a number of people who have a C who are not darkened in. And they're not darkened in, not because they're not going to get Huntington's disease, but they're just not old enough yet. And the disease doesn't onset typically until midlife. So you have to consider that when you're thinking about your phenotype. If you studied only this generation, penetrance is not as high as if you study this generation because penetrance is age dependent. Okay? You also have an example over there of two people who both had Huntington's disease who married, had kids. And of course, that means that each one could pass on the defect, but it also means that you could get a child who got two copies of the defect. And since we know from over here that C is what's traveling with it, we just go look for a child who's a CC over there, and there is one, number 12. So that individual has two copies of the Huntington's disease gene defect. 
That becomes important later for understanding the disorder. So what you get out of the combination of the clinical, the neuropathology, and the genetics is that this is a lifelong process, in essence. You carry that defect from the time that you're born. And if you compare a person who doesn't carry the defect to one who does, you get clinical diagnosis in midlife. You're going to get death 15 or so years after that diagnosis. But you carried the gene before that. So stuff is going on before the diagnosis as a result of the defective gene being within that human system. The problem is it doesn't show up as a clinical phenotype, so nobody can study it easily unless you have the ability to jump back here and look at the gene defect and move forward rather than starting with the disease and moving backward. So it's a fundamental change in how you'd study disease. You don't have to reproduce the phenotype to understand the disease. You have to have what is ultimately going to cause the phenotype and then look at the differences that occur in between. So to get to that, we used linkage initially. We got to an unfortunate region on chromosome 4 because it was out near the tip of the chromosome. And so it pointed out the inadequacies of clinical phenotyping because anybody who made a mistake in diagnosis created an artificial recombinant, but that recombinant that recombination event predicted that the gene was off the end of the chromosome. So we did pick up, in fact, in our studies, a number of what we would classify as misdiagnoses. There's still argument among the clinicians, but um, it's clear they don't have the genetic defect anyway. But eventually, we, we were able to narrow with recombinations on either side to a region that always traveled with the defect. And unfortunately, that region was about 2 million bases in size because this is a region in which recombination doesn't occur as frequently as you'd expect. There's hot spots on either side, but the middle travels pretty much together most of the time. And so we turned to association. Now, th this is not the association you hear about now with SNPs and Manhattan plots, one of which you're going to see later. This is association using the kinds of markers that we used at the time for linkage. And those were restriction fragment length polymorphisms, and by this time, which was the early 90s, uh, simple sequence repeats that could be analyzed as size differences by PCR. So CT, CT, CT repeats, a variety of things that you could look like, at like that. Or VNTRs, which were longer repeats, 50, 100 bases that were repeated, that were detected as differences by southern blots. So they weren't restriction frag, they were seen as fragments on a gel, but they, there were many different versions of it based on repeats. So we were able to use association to look and say, okay, well, we've got a defect that causes Huntington's disease. There's no proven case of a new mutation to Huntington's disease at the time, because to prove that you had it, you would have to find a person who had Huntington's disease. You'd have to have their parent and prove that the parent didn't have Huntington's disease, okay? And, and you'd have to prove that the person who had Huntington's disease was able to pass it on to prove that it was the genetic thing. So you'd need three generations. And since you don't have onset until midlife, you usually don't have the parent. So the few cases of new mutation that had been reported all turned out actually to be non-paternities rather than new mutations. So the idea was maybe there's only ever been one mutation in human history that causes Huntington's disease. In which case, based on the rules of recombination, the particular versions of the markers that were near that particular defect are still going to be the same in all the people who have the defect. So if we just go look for association, go look for markers where the allele is present in all the Huntington's people and none of the normal people, or in some of the normal people but far, far fewer than in the Huntington's, we'd know that we were near the defect. And that homed in the defect to a region of about 150,000 bases where one of the markers we looked at that was particularly hard to analyze because it was a CAG repeat and hard to amplify, turned out to be the defect itself. So it was, it was present uh, in essentially everybody who had Huntington's disease, but not as a discrete fragment, simply as a repeat that was longer than any that we saw in normal individuals. It did, however, turn out by looking at the markers on either side that there wasn't just one mutation in human history. There were people who fell into discrete classes based on the markers on either side of the gene. It's just that there was one that was more frequent than all the others that accounts for about 50% of all cases. So the mutation is this CAG repeat on normal people. Everybody in this room that I 
got chromosomes from and PCR'd, I'd get probably between 6 and 34 of those repeats, depending on a number of factors, ancestry being one of them. And in HD, I'd get more than 35. So the difference between getting HD in a normal lifespan showing symptoms and not can be as little as one CAG repeat in that gene. The distribution, if you look at individuals who are heterozygous, who have one defective gene, one normal, essentially looks like this, where you have a nice spread down in the normal range that goes up to 34, and then a very large spread in the HD range. And the reason for that large spread is that once you get above the low 30s for this repeat, it's now not passed on from generation to generation as the identical size as the previous generation. It's unstable. It changes in size. So in fact, we have one family, one very large family of several hundred individuals where you could reproduce that entire red pattern just within the one family that all inherited essentially the same defect from the same founder, but it changed in size in every generation. So it's unstable. Okay, so to finish the, bi the basics of Huntington's disease essentially that get you to what Mendelian genetics could do in the early days, uh, we got to a gene at the tip of chromosome 4. It produced this long transcript. The CAG repeat was in the 5' prime end of the transcript. That produced this very long protein, 350 kilodalton protein that was named Huntington. The CAG tract turns into a Q-tract, polyglutamine tract, in the end of that protein. And, and that's what is at the base of Huntington's disease. What does the protein do? Didn't look like anything at the time in the, in the databases. Uh, even, even afterwards, it uh, showed a degenerative repeat pattern uh, in the protein that was used through searches to define a class of proteins called heat repeat proteins that have these degenerative repeats and form uh, kind of solenoid-like coils. Importance is an example of those, and the, the, the H in heat is Huntington. But it didn't tell you anything about what the protein did, other than maybe it acts as a scaffold of some kind. But it had, that, that's about the only structural element that has really shown up. I told you there were different mutations in human history. About 50% of the uh, individuals of HD have this haplotype called HAP1. So you can now, knowing where the defect is, go in and look at the variation on either side with the idea being that if you have the same variation around the mutation as someone else, then you have a common ancestor. And that common ancestor suffered the mutation on a particular genetic background. 50% of the people in the world who have Huntington's disease have the mutation on this HAP1 background. Uh, the most common chromosome in the European population is this HAP8 chromosome. And so you can see you can define differences between them. But there are people in the European population who have HD on that HAP8. So it's occurred more than once, and you can go through and defining it, but effectively um, you can look for variation at the locus that then correlates with phenotype beyond presence absence of disease, which is where we're going to go next, but I'm going to not go through this locus because, in fact, nothing has been found at the locus that's really meaningful that relates to phenotype. Everybody who has Huntington's disease has a CAG repeat expansion at that one spot. They may have inherited it from a different ancestor originally, they have the same type of mutation. What differs is the length. And so that's the summary of the distribution of those haplotypes in the population, where the HAP1 is the red and the green is the, is the HAP8. And then there's these others in between, some of which are, in fact, related. HAP5, for example, is, is directly related to HAP1. It has um, been inherited based on one exchange event at the end of the, of the haplotype. OK, so we get back to this cycle. So, so effectively, what, what I just described to you was about I don't know, more than 10 years of work because the technologies weren't there to do most of the steps. They had to be developed. That took you from patients and families through describing phenotype, using that description and the rules of genetics to identify an underlying gene. And then you have to move into trying to understand the mechanism. You already jumped to improving diagnostics because you can do DNA prediction now for those people who haven't had symptoms, even though they haven't reached midlife. Uh, and Maybe you can do things about therapy now without going through the middle, but back then there were no technologies for knocking down genes or, or, or modifying genes. So essentially, we moved ourselves to this spot in the cycle with the knowledge that we were going to continue. And at this spot, I'm not going to tell you too much, but I'm going to do a little bit. 
So I told you that the guts of genetics is genotype-phenotype relationships. In this case, we have a single kind of mutation with different lengths. So our variation in genotype is the length of the CAG. And there are various phenotypes that you see in Huntington's disease, but one of the most notable is this timing of onset. Because while I told you that it typically doesn't onset until midlife, in some people it onsets very early in childhood, in some people it onsets very late in life. So there's a continuum when it can onset. And if you plot the age at neurologic onset, the, the mean age at neurologic onset, against the number of CAG repeats in the individual's gene, you get this very strong correlation. So the longer the repeat, the earlier the onset. That is a, a terrific genotype-phenotype correlation, because the correlation coefficient is like 0.95 or something. However, that is against the mean of the age of onset. If you look at the range of ages of onset associated with any CAG, you see a wide range. And that becomes meaningful afterwards, which I will get back to. So modeling this, you can now model it because you could essentially look at humans and say, you know what, really, humans are just a, an allelic series. They are a whole series of people with different lengths at that location. We could create the same thing in a mouse. We could create the same thing in a fly. We could create the same thing in a model system and study what the effect is of that. And so the important thing here in creating the mouse was not to say, if I make a mouse with this repeat, does it get symptoms that look like Huntington's disease? Because remember, you, in humans, you go 50 years without showing symptoms. A mouse lives two years. The point was, can I see phenotypes that show the same kind of correlation because they are events early in the process? And in fact, that's what turned out to be true with these allelic series of knock-in mice where the CAG repeat was placed into the mouse's endogenous version of the Huntington gene. You can generate phenotypes that occur earlier depending on how much the repeat is, is uh, lengthened. So there's processes going on, even though the mice live a normal lifespan, and at least with the shorter lengths, and uh, don't you know, start moving funny, because mice really don't do that in response to this kind of damage of the cottage. Um, there are processes going on that can be studied. Energetics is one that I'm going to skip. Well, actually, let's just so, show, just look at the graph and see that there's a shaded area and a not shaded area, and that essentially there's a relationship that extends across both, which essentially just says that the CAG repeat is a functional polymorphism. It's having an effect that causes Huntington's disease, but if you go below that range, it's still having a physiological effect. It's regulating energy metabolism in a certain way, ATP, ADP ratio. It has other effects as well. So think of it as, as impacting on the function of the protein, where when you get into the HD range, you're having an extreme impact on the function of the protein. I'm not saying energy metabolism is the basis for the disease. I'm just saying that's one phenotype that shows CAG length dependence. There are others as well. Uh, Similarly, if you go look at networks that are disrupted by the CAG expansion and compare them to networks that are disrupted by just knocking out the protein so that you eliminate its function, you get changes in the same networks, but you don't get the same changes. Sometimes the changes at the bottom of the network are the same because different patterns in between have caused the same effect downstream. And so when you see similarities, it's not because the expansion decreases Huntington's function, it's because it changes the function within a network of its normal function. Okay? And similarly, you can do things in an unbiased way, like just doing uh, uh, RNA gene expression analysis and ignore what the genes are, but pull them out based on their relationship to the length of the CAG and find genes that change in a pattern that relates to the CAG length. And you can put together, and there's a lot, number of, of companies that are doing molecular modeling, causal modeling based on these kinds of things in both mice and people. So there's a lot you can do to try and understand mechanism that doesn't rely on saying, aha, I think this channel is going to be screwed up, or I think this the mitochondria isn't working as well. You can still take an unbiased approach if you reproduce the genetics. Okay, so the fundamental principles to end this part are, I, I haven't given you the data on all this, but I'll tell you it. So humans heterozygous for inactivation, don't have any HD phenotype. They actually seem normal. The homozygotes that I pointed out to you before, they have an age of onset that's the same as the heterozygotes. They're fully viable. They look just like heterozygotes. Okay, so it says two things. One, it says you're not losing this essential function by expanding the repeat. The other is it says that the longer repeat is completely dominant. 
doesn't matter whether the second allele is a normal allele or whether the second allele is another HD allele. You're still getting the same result from that first allele. That's unusual. So even in the normal range, there are consequences of the mutation in both neuronal and non-neuronal cells that you can measure as biochemical or molecular effects. There are other genes in which these kinds of expansions occur. They typically also cause neurological disorders, but they target different neurons and have different effects. And so the specificity of neuronal vulnerability in Huntington's disease is not due simply to CAG expansion. It's due to the fact that the CAG expansion is in the Huntington protein coding sequence rather than the protein coding sequence for androgen receptor, for example, which causes Kennedy's disease. The length of the repeat is the primary determinant of the rate of pathogenesis that leads to onset. And there's remaining variation. And it turns out some of that remaining variation is heritable within families. It shows heritability. So that becomes important. What do you get from this? The conclusion really is that the CAG expansion confers a gain of function rather than a loss of function to the Huntington protein. It acts through some aspect of its structure, localization, or function. It could either be too much function or it could be dysregulated function or it could be dysregulated interactions within the context of its normal interactions. So it becomes critical to understand the normal function of Huntington. For 10 years after the gene was found, because the CAG repeat was so attractive and it led to an expanded polyglutamine tract, and polyglutamine is known to aggregate, and aggregation occurs in Alzheimer's disease, everybody wanted to work on that. Nobody cared about what the normal function was. You couldn't get the funding agencies to try and figure out what Huntington function was. But the human genetics says it's important to understand, and so now people have gone back and they are looking at normal function of Huntington. It turns out to be a really fundamental and interesting multifunctional protein with pleiotropic effects in many systems. There is this quantitative relationship that you can use to study the disease before phenotype. It's being used in model systems. It's now also being used in people because people are getting genetically tested years before they're going to show symptoms, and they can go in and people can do fancy imaging and all kinds of other techniques to try and find the earliest changes that occur. They now find that there's changes 15 years before onset that are detectable if you do the right kind of imaging. Not at the level of the individual, but at the level of population grouping of those individuals. And we also know that the pathogenic effects of mutant Huntington can be modified by other genes based on this heritability difference in the age of onset. And so if you can modify onset, that's what you're trying to do with therapeutics, basically. You're trying to prevent or delay the onset of the disease. You're trying to modify it. The humans themselves say it's possible to do that because there are genetic variations that make a difference. So that becomes essentially a way of trying to get at the disease by going around the cycle again. Now, not taking the patients and families to say, do we have disease or not, but taking those individuals and saying, what was your age of onset, and using that as the phenotype to apply genetics and go around. But I said there's heritability. I didn't say it showed Mendelian inheritance. So now we're into the mode of complex disease. So what it tells you is essentially the difference between Mendelian disease and complex disease is what you choose as a phenotype. If you choose a highly penetrant phenotype, meaning it's going to be there if you have the defect, it's going to be there a high percentage of the time, you can see an inheritance pattern. You call it Mendelian disease. If you choose some aspect of the phenotype that's not always there and doesn't show a clear inheritance pattern, but still is there more frequently than if you didn't have the disease, then you're dealing with complex inheritance. So it all comes down to what you define as the phenotype, but they're both opportunities. So in this particular case, take the population, look at the CAG repeats, look at that range of ages of onset where each of these dots is the age of onset of a person, and you see that there's a shift from one end to the other of about 30 years for the earliest onset versus the latest onset at the same CAG repeat. So if you could find the genes underlying that, you could potentially devise ways of pushing the onset, but you also can use this kind of a curve to define the phenotype. And the phenotype is how far are you from that line in the middle? Do you have a residual difference that is negative or positive? And you can use that for a quantitative approach. And I'm going to skip the next slide because you can also do it as a dichotomous approach where you simply take the extremes and compare allele frequency. You 
if you do the residuals, you can generate this nice normal distribution, where, as I said, you either can do association to the quantitation of that residual, or you could do a cutoff on either side, the ones that are extreme on either side, forget about the quantitation, and just do allele frequency differences. And when you do that, what you do, what you come up with, is what you're going to see for complex disorders in this uh, primer, which is associations. Here's an association on chromosome 15 that actually has two effects. There's one chromosome out in the population that, when placed on a Huntington's disease background, makes Huntington's disease occur about six years earlier than you would have otherwise. And there's another separate chromosome with a variation, the green one in this case, out in the population that, when placed together on a Huntington's disease background, causes the onset of Huntington's disease to be about two years later than you'd expect. So two different variations, probably affecting the same gene. We think it's probably FAN1, but we're not sure. But this is an approach to getting to defects that definitely have an impact on the disease. So you're detecting a genetic interaction here that you want to turn into an interaction that you understand biochemically and physiologically because that's what you want to treat. And so we will skip to the end and skip all of those things and essentially say, if you're going to do genetic research, figure out where you are on the cycle and once you've figured out where you are in the cycle, figure out if you want to do the next step when you've completed yours, or if you don't want to do it, make sure you have somebody around that you can hand it off to, to keep pushing around, and the research in that particular disease will eventually get back as benefit to patients. Uh, and we'll skip the take-home messages and get to the dog. Thank you. <laughs>